Okay, let's start off with some sample diploma board questions. So just give this video a pause, read it through, and see if you can figure it out. Okay, so these are the three that we talked about yesterday. So observe the time delay for the eclipse of the moon of Jupiter. Observe the time delay between uncovering lights on the mountain, that was Galileo. And observe the interference pattern produced by a single source that emits light and travels slightly different but precise, precisely measured distances. So that's kind of like uh, the Fizeau or the, the Michelson experiment. So the least accurate is going to be two, right? You could even find it. And then the next accurate is that. And then the most accurate is that, right? Those precisely measured distances is important. Everything needs to be very precise. Okay, and then 23. So give it a pause and see if you can try this one on your own. I'll do it on my board here. So you have an eight-sided mirror and the frequency of rotation for which the detector, uh, detector will indicate a maximum signal. Uh, they're 30 kilometers apart. Okay, it's V equals D over T. We want to find time because time is the key to get us that um, frequency. So our distance, so it's 60 meters or 30 meters there, 30 meters back. So um, I'm just going to change my pen. Give me one second. Just need a new pen. There we go. Okay. Uh, so the distance is 30 meters there, 30, me 30 kilometers there, 30 kilometers back. So our distance is 60,000 meters. And our speed is the speed of light. And 60,000 divided by 3 times 10 to the 8. Oops. 60,000 divided by 3 times 10 to the 8. And you get your time to be 2 times 10 to the negative 4 seconds, right? So remember, for it to go there and back, our mirrors just rotate 1 eighth of a rotation. So that's 1 eighth of a rotation. So we want a full rotation. So we got to multiply that number by 8 in order to get a full rotation. So a full rotation is 0 0.016 seconds, but that's one rotation. And then to get that into a frequency, we inverse it and we get 625 hertz or rotations per second. Okay, so that's going to be A as our correct answer. Okay, so hopefully those went okay. And that's the kind of questions you can see on your quiz. So today we're going to talk about Snell's Law. In fact, diamonds don't shine, they refract. So we are going to learn, um, describe qualitatively and quantitatively how refraction supports the wave model of EMR. We're going to learn a new formula. Formula. There it is. We're going to learn a new formula. Uh, we're going to describe quantitatively the phenomena of refraction, including total internal reflection. So you need to know what this is. And then predict the colors required, or sorry, conditions required for total internal reflection. So you get, definitely got to know about total internal reflection when this is done. Okay, so light refracts. So refracting is when a wave bends so that the angle changes as it moves through a new medium. Right, so the light goes through this medium of air and then it enters medium of glass and it bends, right? Or light is in air and then it enters water and it bends. And we've all seen refraction like this. So refraction is a wave property. So the fact that light refracts is evidence that it is a wave. So when light enters a new medium, the properties of the light wave change. The more dense the material, the more it, I don't like it there, the more the light slows down. So it is the light. So the opposite, to, this is opposite to mechanical waves where they speed up as they enter a more dense medium. So light is behaving a little bit differently than normal waves. So the smaller the wavelength, um, Sorry, the wavelength will also get smaller as light enters the new medium. So if both C and lambda change, uh, yeah, there's some typos in here. So if both C and lambda decrease at the same rate, what will happen to the frequency? 
right? So let's talk about that. So um, the wavelength will also get smaller as light enters the new medium. So, and then the, it slows down. So C equals lambda F is our equation, right? Uh, and if we want to talk about what happens to frequency, well, let's throw lambda down here. So we can see that C and F have a direct relationship. So if the speed of light slows down, then that's going to directly affect F and it's going to slow it down. But if the wavelength decreases as well, well, they have an inverse relationship. So if my wavelength decreases, that's going to increase my frequency. So if both of these go down, my frequency stays the same. Okay, so there's lots of typos on this page, but what I'm, to sum up what I'm trying to say, so as light enters a new medium, the more dense the material, the slower it goes, the smaller the wavelength gets, but our frequency remains the same. I gotta fix that page up. Okay, so this is a video on why light slows down. It's really cool. It shows that light doesn't actually slow down, so take a watch and, uh, we all know that light bends when it travels through glass, water, or other transparent material. That's how a microscope, lighthouse, and spectacles all work. And you might even know that light bends because it travels slower through glass or water than through air. But why does light slow down? And how does it speed up again when it comes out on the other side? There's nothing there to give it a push. Well, if you think light is a wave, it's easy to explain. Electromagnetic waves simply travel slower through glass than through air. So the wave crests are closer to each other, but the light still oscillates the same number of times per second. It stays the same color. When the wave hits the air again, its color still doesn't change, while the crests spread out and it returns to light speed. The simplified explanation is that the energy of a wave is determined by its frequency or color, which doesn't change. So it doesn't need a boost to speed up at the other side. But wait, you say, I thought light travel at the same speed in every reference frame. You still haven't explained how it can slow down. Well now let's think about light as a particle. When light goes through glass, it gets knocked around and bumps into all sorts of molecules and electrons. So whenever it's traveling, it's traveling at the speed of light. But it's busy interacting with and scattering off lots of stuff along the way, and it doesn't necessarily take the shortest path through the glass. It's like the President of the United States trying to cross a room. If the room is empty, he can walk across directly. But if the room is full of people, all of whom want to shake the President's hand, even though he walks from person to person at full presidential speed, he'll get slowed down along the way. As soon as he reaches the far side of the room, though, he's free to resume his pace. Full speed ahead, Mr. President. Some pretty cool video on why light slows down when it doesn't. Uh, so this is Snell's Law, where one is your index ray, um, and two is your refracted ray. So we'll talk about what that is when we look at a diagram. Uh, sine theta is the angle uh, against the normal. Again, I'll talk about that in the diagram. V is velocity of the rays, y, uh, lambda is wavelength of the rays, and n is index of refraction. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll show you a diagram in a sec. Uh, so where you can find this formula, where is it? Physics 30 data sheet. Oh no, I only have physics and data sheets. Mm, oh, my desk is so messy because there's no one to clean up for. Let me find, just let me go grab one really quick and I can show you where to find that on your formula sheet running over describing it because you can't see. Physics 30 data sheet. There's one. And running back, running back. Ah, okay. Um, so these are all found under waves. So uh, they, it's broken up into two formulas. So these are the two right there. So it's under waves because these are all wave properties. Okay. So index of a refraction is uh, is n. So this is kind of new to us. So index of refraction is kind of like coefficient of friction, same idea. So index of refraction is a measure of material density. So index of refraction of a vacuum is 1. So that's sort of our starting point. 
Uh, so other mediums are going to have a, a greater index of refraction than one. So air is just a tiny little bit greater than one, so it's basically one. Water is 1.33, and that depends on the temperature and salinity, so how much salt is in the water. Uh, ice is a little bit less, glycerin is more. Diamond has a big index of refraction, and that's why people like diamonds, because they're sparkly, we'll talk about that. And cubic zirconia, which is a fake diamond, is 2.2, and that's why people don't want it, because it's not as sparkly. Okay, so sine angles have an inverse relationship to index of refraction. So as light passes from a medium of lower index of refraction to a higher one, it will go from a larger angle to the smaller one. So what we say is it's going to bend towards the normal. And light passes from a, from a higher index of refraction to a lower one, it will bend away from the normal. And I will explain all of this in a diagram because you're probably like sitting at home saying what is going on. Okay, so let's, let's draw this, let's draw this example. So we talked about this in physics 20, but this is a normal line. So a normal line, normal line. So this is our normal line right here. And this is our surface. This is the interface between them. And our normal line is just perpendicular 90 degrees to the surface. So up here we have air. And down here we have water. Okay. So if a beam of light comes in like this... Well, this is our index angle. This is our number one. And we always measure that angle from the normal, never from the surface, or else Snell's law doesn't work properly. So what we want to figure out is, is this angle going to get bigger or is it going to get smaller? So what we have to do is we have to look at air. So air is basically 1.00 to two, three sig digs. And water, we said, is 1.33. You don't have to memorize those. Um, they'll be given to you except for air is one, but you'll know that. So what we're doing is we're going from a lower index of refraction to a higher one. So going back to this, because two is on top, one is below, one is below, one is on top, two is, is below, uh, it's, it's an inverse relationship, right? So this is what this is saying here. So because we're going from low to high, our angle is gonna go from high to low. So this angle is going to get lower. This angle is going to get smaller, right? And this is a, a useful thing to memorize. It lets you do questions really quick if you just memorize low to high equals high to low. If we switch it, if we put water up here and air down here, and water is 1.33, which is high, and air is 1.00 which is low and our beam of light comes in so this is our incoming light ray angle this is one um, so because we're going high to low with our indexes we're going to go low to high with our angle so what's going to happen is it's going to bend away from that normal line so this theta 2 is going to get bigger and it's a higher one So hopefully that makes sense. Let me know if you have any questions about that. So with this second example, when our angle gets bigger, what's going to happen is it's going to keep, as this angle gets bigger, this angle is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually we're going to reach our critical angle. So a critical angle is the angle that no longer allows light to refract, and all light is reflected. If the light bends away from the normal line of medium two, then the critical angle for medium two is 90 degrees. Okay, so what I mean by that is if this light comes in and we bend away like that, well, if I send in a beam, I'm gonna switch my colors up, if I send in a beam with a slightly bigger angle, well, all of a sudden we're gonna reach here, which is 90 degrees. Okay, so, this angle here of my blue one, which made me reach 90 degrees, is called our critical angle. Okay. So here's a video that shows this idea of a critical
So what she saw in that video was this idea of total internal reflection. So for total internal reflection to work, you need to go from a high index of refraction to a low one, because we need to bend away from that normal. So if you just send a beam of light straight through, it'll go straight through, just like we see in this picture here. Um, but when we make this angle 15 degrees, it bends more, it's 20. When we make this angle 30, it bends at 42. When we bend at 45, it bends at 70. And then at a certain point, we bend it so much that it reaches 90 degrees. I'm just going to switch to a black pen. So it reaches 90 degrees here. And then anything after that angle, it just gets reflected like we saw in that video. That's what we want. So total internal reflection is what's happening when all the incident light, the light that's coming in, reaches that 90 degrees. And after that angle, after we reach that critical angle, we just see reflection of the light. So this is the reason why pool lights can't be seen at all angles. So if you angled a pool light like this, you, it, would, it wouldn't come out of the water. You wouldn't be able to see it. And then you get that glowing pool effect, which uh, looks really cool if you're rich. So diamonds use this idea of total or internal reflection. So diamonds are cut so that all the light leaves at the top. That's what makes them sparkly. So the high index of refraction of diamonds allows light going in a straight path to leave the diamond. So there's different cuts for a diamond. So although you can have a good diamond, if it's cut wrong, it's not going to be nice and sparkly. So this is an ideal cut for a diamond. So this light coming in just goes straight through, because if you send it straight in, it'll just go straight through. But this angle, if we draw in a normal line, is past that critical angle, so it reflects. And then this angle is past that critical angle, so it reflects. So all the light coming in comes out, so that's why the diamond is sparkly. But if you cut it too deep, the light coming in, and yes, you'll get reflection, total internal reflection happening here, but this angle isn't big enough here so that you don't get that total internal reflection and you get the light to refract and you get it to move out. So this diamond wouldn't be as sparkly. Same thing with this one that's cut too shallow. It wouldn't be as sparkly as well. So you want it, that ideal cut so you reach those critical angles on both sides and you get a sparkly diamond. Fiber optics work this way. I have a demo. We'll see how that works with my camera. So fiber optics have a core of flexible glass with a high index of refraction. So this allows light to stay inside the glass core. So I'm going to show my demo here. I shut off the lights. So here I have a laser pointer. And here I have uh, some glass. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shine my laser inside of this glass. And what you can see, so I'm shooting the laser inside of here. And you can see the, the laser. It's actually kind of cool. You can see the laser. Uh, where's my camera? There it is. You can see it reflecting inside of there. You can see that laser light. And what it does is it, it sort of goes around this thing very well. And you can see that the brightest image is right on the top here. And that's because all this laser light stays in and then it comes out the top. So you can send information and light. You can send a signal like a TV signal or, some, or an internet signal. And yeah, all the light stays in this fiber optic region here. So that's kind of cool. So what we need for fiber optics to work is we need a high index of refraction inside and a lower one outside. Because when I send this light signal in, right, this is my normal line here. This is my angle. This is way past my critical angle. So none of that light's going to leave. It's just going to reflect inside of here. And the same thing's going to happen here. It's going to reflect, and you're not going to get any of that light to leave. And that's what you want. That light is your signal. That light's your information. So you don't want any of that light to leave. So an example of a critical angle in an air-water interface. So this would be calculating it. Um, so first thing we need, if we want to reach that critical angle, we have to go high here and low here. So our higher index of refraction is water at 1.33, and low is air, which is at 1.00. So I'm going to send my beam of light in like this, and this is my incident angle. 
and then I want to find out what is that that critical angle going to be so that I reach my 90 degrees here because your second angle theta 2 will always be 90 degrees when you're trying to find what your critical angle one is so we're going to use Snell's law um, and we're trying to find this so for Snell's law the formula is sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 is equal to um, n2 over n1 and they always have to be opposite like that so we want to find sine theta 1 so we move our sine theta 2 over here and to find this angle here we have to get rid of the sine so we got a sine negative 1 all of this and that will get rid of the sine over here okay, so n2 this is 1 this is 2 uh, so n2 is 1 and then water and 1 is 1.33 and then sine theta uh, 2 is going to be 90 degrees and we have to sine negative 1 all of this okay so if we plug that into our calculator I'll just go 1 times sine 90 make sure you're in degree mode which is 1 always going to be 1 divided by 1.33 so that's the answer in here and then I got a sine negative 1 that answer from before so that tells me that this critical angle is 48 degrees so anything past 48 degrees will just reflect and anything less won't reach that critical angle okay. so refraction can happen in the same medium if you have drastic temperature or pressure changes so water waves change direction as they approach the warmer shallower water and you get a little bit of bending of waves sound waves can bend in cooler night air so you get some weird like owl noises and things like that uh, light waves also bend in cooler wear air above hot desert air producing mirages so here's some examples of mirages so they usually happen at nighttime or in the morning so this is nighttime or the morning one of the two so where the water is really warm and the air is really cool so it looks like you have a sunrise right here but you also have a sunrise right here so this this is a mirage right here this is not real um, this is the real sun sunset or sunrise one of the two I don't know hard to tell okay so this is it looks like there's a boat on top of a boat so this is a real boat but that that cool air and hot or cool air and hot water or vice versa causes uh, to get a mirror image it bends that light and this is probably one you've seen all the time so this happens a lot in the springtime when the air is really cool but the sun is warm so you get a really hot road but cool air and it looks like the road is glassy uh, but it's just sort of refracting that light from the sky okay, and that's what mirages are is you'd see water and then as you get closer it goes away because it's just refraction okay prisms so because white light is made up of all the different wavelengths 400 being violet and 700 being red Snell's law predicts that these different wavelengths will bend at different rates so prism the prisms breaking up light is called dispersion so it's a pink Floyd cover here you can see the white lights breaking up in all the different colors so red light bends the least because it has the highest wavelength and um, violet light bends the most because it has the lowest wavelength so that's not an easy way to remember it so, so the way that I like to remember it is uh, let me just switch here so I can write it down for you red refracts the worst like worst but worst red refracts the worst so that's the way that I like to remember it uh, violet's the best and red refracts worst some people say red refracts rotten but I like worst do what you like okay so uh, sunset has to do with refraction the reason that um, the sky is is red at sunset and sunrise is because of refraction and it has to do with the, the fact that red refracts the worst so 
white light travels through our atmosphere, and as it goes through the atmosphere, it bends. That red light goes the straightest, and all the other ones bend below the horizon. So what, if this is the horizon, right? See, right here, all we see is a red light that's left. So as light travels toward us, the particles in the atmosphere act like a prism and refracts the light. And since red refracts the worst, uh, it is the most visible because most of the blues and greens have gone below the horizon. Let me get these beautiful sunsets sitting in my windowless classroom, talking to myself, looking at beautiful sunsets. Okay, so let's do a few examples here. So if the index of refraction of water is 1.33, uh, what is the speed of light in water? Okay. So, if the index of refraction of water, so we have index of refraction of water, and uh, one thing that you always know, so on the back of your data book, it tells you the index of refraction of air is 1.00. So you always know that, and you always know the speed of light in air, uh, which is the same as a vacuum, which is three times 10 to the eight. So if we wanna find uh, the speed of light in water, we're gonna use Snell's law here. So we're gonna use M2 over N1, equals v1 over v2 and it's always going to be opposite for index of refraction they're always going to be uh, different there okay so it's good to keep things organized right so we can go from air to water water to air it doesn't matter uh, you just have to make one of them one and one of them two okay so water is going to be r2 so we want to find out v2 so i'm going to move v2 up top i'm going to move n1 up top I'm going to move N2 down below like that. So one is air. We always know the speed of light in air is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. It's going to be the same as a vacuum. N1 is air, which is always one. And then N2 is the water, which the question told us is 1.33. So you should always be slower when you're going to a more dense medium. So three times 10 to the eight divided by 1.33, and we get 2.33. 26 times 10 to the 8 meters per second and it's a little bit slower in the water okay so this is our last question here we're just going to go through all the different ones that you can do so it's a big question we're not going to do all of it uh, so a monochromatic laser so monochromatic is one colored laser because we don't want different colors all bending at different uh, rates so a monochromatic laser beam of wavelengths 432 nanometers is shone into a glass aquarium filled with water at an angle of 60 degrees relative to the surface of the glass. Ooh, that's not good. We always want to be to the normal, so we'll have to change that. So if the index of refraction of water is 1.33 and the index of refraction of glass is 1.52, um, calculate the speed, wavelength, and frequency of light in the glass. Calculate the speed, wavelength, and frequency of light in the water. And what is the angle of refraction in the glass? So I don't usually do all of this in classes because you get the point uh, pretty quickly. Okay, so let's draw out a little picture of what this looks like. So we have an aquarium. So out here is air. This is where we are. These are eyeballs. You're looking, looking into the aquarium there. And then the aquarium is made of glass. And inside the aquarium is water like that right so this is your thin glass this is your water so the question says that we send a beam of light in I'm just going to draw a normal line here we send a beam of light in at 60 degrees 60 degrees relative to the surface oops I talked about changing it didn't change it right so if this is 60 degrees and this is 30 degrees from the normal and we, it tells us that the index of refraction of water is 1.33, glass is 1.52, and then we know that air is 1.00. Okay, so calculate the speed, wavelength, and frequency of light in the glass. Um, sure. So if we go from a low to high, 
we're going to go from high to low. So it looks like it's going to bend towards the normal here. So we can we can estimate that angle there. And then as it goes from a higher to a lower, it's going to go lower to a higher. So this is going to bend slightly away from the normal line there. And that's kind of it's kind of going to switch each time. So if we want to calculate the speed of the speed of light in the glass, we can just go um, n2 over n1 equals v2, v1 over v2. Okay, that's our Snell's law. And then so this will be 1, this will be 2. So we're trying to find v2. Oops, we're trying to find v2, not n2. Sorry, I'm tired. I've been doing the videos all day. So we'll have to rearrange it just like we did before. So V1 is air, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and 1 is 1. And N2 is the glass, which is 1.52. And because it's got a bigger index of refraction, it should slow down even more than the last question. So 3 times 10 to the 8 times 1 divided by 1.52, and we get 1.97 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, just like I said. Okay. Well, we also want to find the wavelengths. So we can use the index of refractions for that. Uh, so we want to find wavelength 2. So I'll put that on top so we don't have to do so much rearranging. And n1 over n2. So as long as you make them opposite, it doesn't matter what you start with. So we want to find this wavelength 2. We want to find that wavelength of the, of the glass. Okay, so n1 is our air, which is 1.00. And then the question they told us that the wavelength of light was 432 nanometers. So 432, and nano, if you look it up, is times 10 to the negative 9. So instead of writing nano, I'll write times 10 to the negative 9 meters, all divided by 1.52. So 1 times 432 times 10 to the negative 9 divided by 1.52. And we get... 2.84 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. So that's our wavelength in the glass. So our wavelength changes. So what we should get used to is we usually list things in nanometers. So instead of writing it like this, 2.84 times 10 to the negative 7, if you move the decimal place over two spots, it becomes 284 times 10 to the negative 9 meters. And we said negative 9 is nanometers. So more than likely, we would answer this as 284 nanometers would be a better question. Oops, sorry, I just realized I went off the page there. So this would be 284 times 10 to the negative 9 meters, and this is 284 nanometers. So that's how we usually answer wavelength is in nanometers, 284. Okay, and then they want to know the frequency of the light in the glass. So what we can use is we can use C equals lambda f, and we can use our speed of light in the glass, which is uh, 1.97 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And then we can use um, 2.84 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. So that's our speed and that's our wavelength. So if I go and... I just want to use a full answer. So this is my my speed, and then I divide it by so I get my frequency to be, to be two point or sorry, six point nine five times ten to the fourteen hertz. So remember, very first thing we said is that although the speed of light and the wavelength change, uh, the frequency doesn't. So what we're going to do is we're going to do another calculation up here of what the frequency would be in the air. So the frequency in the air, the speed of light would be 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and the wavelength would be 432 times 10 to the negative 9 meters, 432 nanometers. And if we do that calculation, 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by 432 times 10 to the negative 9, we end up getting 6.95 times 10 to the 14 hertz. So you can see that our frequency doesn't change. Our frequency stays the same from air to glass to water 
it's all the same. And like I said, we don't need to do calculate the speed, wavelength, and frequency in the water. Um, not really that tricky, but we can calculate the, the refraction, what the new angle would be. We predicted that it would be smaller, so let's let's do that. So we want to find sine theta two over sine theta one equals n one over n two. Sine theta one moves up top, and then we sine negative one all of this to find that. So n one is one. Sine theta one is sine of thirty divided by one point five two. I'll sign negative one it. So one times sine thirty divided by one point five two. And I sign negative one my answer, and I get nineteen degrees. So this angle is nineteen degrees and it was smaller, just like we predicted. Okay, so give that a go. Here is the homework for that. So it's got some reflection, refraction, some total internal reflection, and some graphing stuff in there. So give that a go. Uh, it's quite a bit of homework that I'm giving you. Um, so yeah, try to do it um, as soon as possible and get as much of it done as you can. Okay. Thanks for watching. Hey, uh, I thought I'd go over through these sample diploma questions and post them. So. Uh, here we are. So a ray of light is incident on a right angle prism in air, as shown below. So the index of refraction of the prism is. Okay. So they give you. So we know we know about air, right? Air is always one, um, and we have the angles here. So we want to find the index of refraction of the prism. So we can go n two. So this is two. This is one. N two is my prism. N one is air. And then um, it's got to be sine theta 1 over sine theta 2. And then just move uh, n1 up top. Okay, so uh, let me just open the calculator and we can type this in. So the, the angle of 1 is 30 degrees. So sine of 30 times, oops, close that bracket times 1, because that's the index of refraction of air, and then we divide it by the sine of our angle 2, which is 17.8. We get 1.63. So 1.64. So B is the correct answer. Okay, and a group of students conducts a series of tests to show which combination of optical media results in the largest critical angle for one wavelength visible light. So the largest critical angle. So remember, if we want a critical angle, we have to go from a high index of refraction to a low index of refraction. So what that allows us to do is eliminate two of the answers. So glass to quartz, glass to quartz is low to high. So A can't be the answer. Okay, and then water to flint glass, water to flint glass is low to high. So it's got to go high to low, right? Because what we want to do is we want to bend away from that normal. And if we bend away from that normal, um, then we'll reach our critical angle. And the critical angle is this one. And then when we've reached our critical angle, it's 90 degrees for this one. Okay. Um, so what I would do is I would just test these two out. Um, yeah, that's probably what I would do. Um, so I'm going to switch to this here. So we're either picking from quartz to glass or flint glass to water. So I would take my time with this one. A lot of people get this one wrong. So we are going from quartz to glass. And quartz is 1.54. And glass is 1.46. Okay, so we come in. We want to know what this angle is. And we know that this one is 90 degrees. So we're trying to find this angle here. So it's going to be, we're trying to find sine theta 1 over sine theta 2. And we're going to use n2 over n1. And then move sine theta 2 over here. And then sine negative 1, this right here. So let's plug that stuff in. 
So N2 is 1.46. And then we're going to multiply it by sine theta 2, which is always 90 degrees when we're trying to find that critical angle. And then divide it by our N1, which is 1.54. And we get, oops, <laughs> got a sine negative 1, our answer. And we get 71 degrees. So that's 71 degrees. Okay, so I'm going to do the same thing with the other one to check it. So for this one, we're going flint glass to water. Into water, which is 1.33. Oops. Again, this is 90 degrees trying to find this so we'd use the same formula but with the new numbers okay so let's try that one out um, put it down here I guess we can put it down here so 1.7 and 1.33 so m2 is 1.33 times sine of 90 and then divided by the 1.7 and then sine negative 1 that answer and we get 51.5 degrees so let's say 52 degrees because the angle doesn't even matter right so we're looking for the largest critical angle so it looks like this one here when we have the smaller difference so it looks like b would be the correct answer Okay. And light travels the slow, slowest through, so this one's really easy. It's going to be slowest through the biggest index or fraction, so glass would be the slowest. Okay. And the angle for the glass would be, so you don't have to jump from this to this to this, so you can make this one and this two. It doesn't actually make a difference, so we're trying to find um, the angle of the glass, so we're going to try to find sine theta two over sine theta 1 equals n1 over n2 and move sine theta 1 up top and then sine negative 1 this whole side here okay. uh, so n1 is the air and times it by sine theta 1 went to 36.8 and then divide it by n2 which is the glass which is 1.5 and then sine negative 1 your answer and you get 23.5 so 23.5 would be the answer for this one okay this last one is definitely a weird one and what this has to do with Um, so lots of times when we write this out, we, we say that the index of a fraction is like 1.5, but that's not 100% true. And with questions like this, we see that that's not 100% true. So because different lights bend differently, right? We talked about red refracting the worst, right? So when red light comes in, it doesn't bend very much, but when purple light comes in it bends a lot right so the angles are different so if they're bending differently that means that the index of refraction for the different wavelengths are actually different right um, so we see white light come in it splits into red and violet so we see they end up broken up differently and if we read the answer, the index of refraction of red light and flint glass is greater. Well, the index of refraction is going to be less than, right? Because it doesn't refract as much. And the bigger index of refraction, it means it refracts. Um, the bigger index of refraction means re refracting more. So it's not going to be less, right? So we read the index of refraction of red light and flint glass is less than violet light because red light refracts less inside. And yeah, that's 100% true. C and D talks about reflecting, but we want to talk about refracting, not reflecting. When, when re, although it does reflect, it, it's the refracting that makes it bend at different angles. So B 
is the correct answer. Okay, so I hope that went okay. If you have any questions, let me know.